Okay, go for it. Okay. Speak loudly. An announcement before you guys start. Originally, the quiz was supposed to be on Monday, but I didn't finish HPLC lecture, so the quiz is on Wednesday. I know some of you have quality, so that might be a good news for some of you. And yes, so extra two days to study. You can only go so far. <laughs> um, okay, so you guys, what we're gonna do again, we did this a couple of years ago. So my office hours on Thursdays, we're gonna turn them into a study session. So the idea is if there's any concepts or things you're confused about, it's meant to be like a group study. So I'm not gonna go through and like, go bit by sure. bit about lab or like part questions and stuff like that. It's more about attacking concepts. Like are you confused about the GC detectors? We'll talk through them. You guys will help each other talk through them. For those who have lab report questions or other things like that on Thursday afternoons, I'll be able to catch you like before and after. So we'll turn kind of that hour into just a study discussion time for anybody who wants to go through things. Yeah, Katie? Um, my office hours are from three to four on Thursdays. Okay. Well, well good. Um, as you know, my business is flavor, and I always tell my students there's no such thing as a bad flavor or a bad smell. They're just interesting. They're different. However, <laughs> I will make an exception in this case. <laughs> that, was, that was fairly unpleasant. Well, anyway, <laughs> um, I get to continue to, in talking about mass spectrometry, so gas chromatography, mass spectrometry. Actually, I, I operated a mass spectrometry laboratory service for four years, so I spent a little bit of time in, in this field, and it's a fascinating area. So let, let's go on, though, considering our time. You know, what are the primary purposes of mass spectrometry? They're really these, these three. They get used in other ways, but these are the primary purposes. To identify unknown compounds, You've got a peak on an HPLC, you have a peak on a gas schematograph, you've got something you don't know what it is, there's no better tool than mass spectrometry for structural elucidation, for identification. We also then use it to quantify known compounds, so let's use this as a specific detector, which I talked about last time for gas chromatography. It can be very specific and we use it then to identify, I'm sorry, to quantify known compounds. Beyond that, as I mentioned, elucidate structure, chemical properties of molecules as well. So exceedingly useful task, or a tool, I'm sorry. There's some trivial changes to this PowerPoint versus what you have. One of the trivial changes, the refer, the, the URL below is a, a new one. The other page doesn't go anywhere anymore. So anyway, this, uh, and this will be posted, so you, you'll get this copy on the Moodle site. So that's a, ASMS is American Society for Mass Spectrometry. It's absolutely a great website if you're interested in MS at all. Applications, well, I only put one slide. I could have put probably three slides exactly like this up here with listing the uses of mass spectrometry. Detect and identify the use of steroids in athletes as someone uh, is being suspected of doping in one way or another. This is the tool that's used to find that. Monitor the breath of patients, patients by anesthesiologists during surgery. So what do we have? Little MS next in the operating room, checking out the, the dosage, the amount of anesthetic you're getting. Determine the composition of molecules in space. I'm giving you a little diversity here. How's, how's that? Not necessarily foods. Here we go. Determine whether honey is adulterated with, with corn syrup. Nice profit in that. Locate oil deposits by measuring petroleum precursors. Monitor fermentation processes for biotechnology. Detect di dioxins in contaminated fish. Determine gene damage in environmental cases. Establish animal con composition of semiconductors. Determine ho ho if horses are given cobra toxins. In other words, the dead and the pain. If they're running in a race, they don't notice that they're, they're suffering in the process. And like I said, I could go on for two more slides in terms of uses of mass spectrometry. Why is it so broadly used? One thing it really offers is sensitivity. You look at that, 10 to minus 12 to 10 to minus 15th grams. That's pretty decent if you think about it. That is really tiny. 
we look at most other techniques that we might use in identification, it takes a bucket in comparison to what mass spectrometry does. So we look for trace amounts. We can detect trace amounts. We can quantify trace amounts using this technique. And as I said, we get a lot of structural information out of it. If, it's, if the compound isn't known, we can learn a great deal by looking at how it blows apart, the pieces it blows into. It basically is, I drew an analogy, it's like you've got a jigsaw puzzle, you toss it up at the air and looking at the pieces. You can theoretically, in fact here, <laughs> tell what the puzzle was, the picture was in the beginning. And I also gave an example of looking at quantifying compounds. I showed you one peak, one appear to be one compound, but can be made up of two or three compounds. The mass spectrometer gives you the ability to quantify without separation, which is really neat. We work so hard to get separation in our, in our uh, separations, in our analyses. We don't necessarily have to if we got mass spectrometry. We can still measure specific components that aren't resolved. So very, very powerful tool. These are the, the parts of a, of a typical mass spectrometer. You'll find, of course, sample introduction. We've got to have some way to get the sample into our system. So just like we have an injection port in gas chromatography, we have one way or another an inlet to put our sample into our machine. There's a source, and the source is a source of energy. So whatever goes in that inlet, it gets bombarded by energy, gets blown into pieces. So our source blows it up. <laughs> Then our next step is it blew up, produced all those fragments of pieces of our molecule. Well, now we've got to separate those pieces, those fragments, those bits, and count them. Okay, we got this piece, how many of these pieces? So we're actually breaking down and getting a profile of the pieces our molecule was broken into. So that's where analyzer does. Our ion detector then measures each of these ions, each of the pieces that come out of the mass spectrometer. So just like a flame ionization detector, we're detecting what comes out of our analyzer. Then of course you got the usual data system, data output. So these are the parts and we'll go through each of these parts in varying um, time. How's, how's that? Uh, for sources, we will we'll get to inlets a little bit later. So we're going to go right to the source. The most common one, and the, one of the earliest sources, what we call electron impact. So I'm going to hit molecules with electrons, high energy electrons. If you, so okay, I, I was gonna get ahead of myself. Pure compound, uh, ideally, goes into the mass spectrometer, and that can be done in different ways, and I'll talk more about gas chromatograph feeding it or HPLC feeding it. But there is a way to put a sample directly into the mass spectrometer. You really want it to be pure. You don't want to mess it up unless you have to. So we'll talk about them. But down here, I said the compound is bombarded by high energy electrons, 70 electron volts. Most of our bonds, our covalent bonds, are 10 electron volts or less. So we put in so much more energy. And the, as I said, our molecule breaks apart, but the weakest bonds break, and the strongest bonds stay together. So there is a pattern to the fragments based on structure. This is our electron impact source. Basically, it shows molecules or sample entering the system. So our sample is flowing into the source, right? Underneath that flow of sample, there's a high energy filament. That filament is giving off electrons. Its electrons are being drawn up to an electron collector at the top, so electrons come off. So there's a constant stream of these 70 electron volts, electrons flowing right through the sample path. Our analytes, things we want to measure, absorb the electrons and like I say, blow into bits and pieces. The bits and pieces then, some are negatively charged, some are not charged, and some are positively charged. So we get all kinds of ions and fragments. We actually have a way that we draw our positively charged 
bits and pieces into our mass spectrometer for measurement. The negative ones get pumped out in the vacuum outside the machine. They get neutralized. So everything else goes away. The positively charged bits and pieces go get drug into the analyzers of the machine. As I said, molecule fragments at weak points are a variety of fragments, get a complex fragmentation pattern, and we simply analyze those positively charged pieces. So let's go ahead and start counting them. How big is the mass? How many do we have? So we're going to get a pattern, a pattern of fragments, positively charged fragments that we use for identification. A couple terms that are useful. A parent ion. If we look at the parent ion, that's our intact molecule. Some of these molecules won't really be exploded into pieces. And so there'll be some that simply take on a positively charge. So you think about it, the molecule is completely intact. That would be the molecular weight of the compounds we're analyzing. So parent ion, our intact molecule with a positive charge. Our base peak is the most abundant fragment. So parent ion, the largest molecular weight of the molecule. The base peak, the most common fragment, the most abundant fragment. And so what you'll, you'll find is that you get this fragmentation pattern, all these ions. One will be more than others. That's given a value of 100%. But another one might be only 80% of that. So they're all based on size-wise on that most abundant peak. So if you look at the y-axis on, on a mass spectrum, it basically goes from 0 to 100% is the idea. 100% is our base peak. This uh, sh go shows a plot of ion intensity versus um, mass down here. A very, very simple molecule, CO2, a carbon dioxide. What would its spectrum look like? It would have a large charged uh, parent ion, CO2. What's the mass of CO2? 16 for oxygen, so there's two of them. There's 32 for the two oxygens. The mass of 12, so carbon's 12, two oxygens, 32. CO2, molecular weight is 44. What do we see in the spectrum? We see our parent ion as a very abundant fragment. Then we lose one oxygen, some of these pieces, you had the oxygen blown off it. OK. So there's an um, ion fragment at 28. Well, what else is there? We can actually blow it up so there's simply free oxygen and free carbon. So that pattern, that pattern is unique and characteristic of every molecule. Right. In this case, you're right. It's not, it's not what? It's not no, not uh, seldom is actually for this type of fragmentation because we put really high energy, the 70 electron volts. So we don't oftentimes see that, that parent ion. What we do is we take a trick and we start lowering that energy so we do less and less fragmentation because it's always nice to know the molecular weight of the compound. That's really, really helpful. So we're never happy when we don't see it actually. So this is a very simple spectrum. Why do we like electron impact? It is the number one uh, ion source used. Uh, good fragmentation. If we don't blow this thing into pieces and we've only got the parent compound, then there's a lot of things of mass 58 or 136. Just if we only had one ion, it wouldn't be helpful. But if we blow it into many pieces, then we can get some unique patterns. So high energy, lots of pieces, more pieces, the better our identification is. The disadvantages, we do like to see that pair nine, like I say. Knowing the molecular weight makes life easier. So it's a bummer when we don't see it. And to some extent, it will be reduced in sensitivity if we only have one ion to measure, we can measure it well. If we have 
a hundred pieces, well, we never get the intensity of any of those hundred pieces that's equal. So we pay a little bit in sensitivity. And like I say, we'd like to see that parent eye, and we'd like to know the molecular weight of our compound. This is a, an example of why we're, when we don't see the parent ion, this is a, a mass spectrum of ephedrine. Ephedrine, what happens is this bond between this oxygen, and here we got a nitrogen coming off here, aromatic ring, that's an exceedingly weak bond. And so what happens is you don't see anything out here at the molecular weight. Its molecular weight should be 165, so it should be here, not a trace. What we do find is this most abundant fragment, mass 58. And so that wouldn't be a lot of information for us to use identification, just one peak at 58. That would be a tough one. We'd like, we'd like to see that. So sometimes we see it, sometimes we don't. We really do like to have that molecular weight. I'll show you how we get around that in a moment. What's a, what's a solution? The solution tends to be chemical ionization. So this is another way to put energy into a molecule to have it fragment, to blow into pieces. But it's a very gentle technique. What I do is I make a reagent gas. I take a gas such as methane, isobutane, or ammonia and I run that through an ion source. So we ionize methane, isobutane, or ammonia, and we mix these ionized reagent gases with our analytes, things we want to measure. And now I transfer energy from my reagent gas to my molecule, and it will tend to take that energy and blow apart. But it's a very low energy transfer and so now we're going to see that parent ion. We'll see that in our identification. So it's very selective, can have excellent sensitivity, and it tells us molecular weight. So it's really got, got its place. The problem is there's not enough fragments to do identification. So I would tend to use this for quantification. I wouldn't use it for identification. I like electron impact, lots of fragments, lots of possibility of putting them together and knowing the compound. This doesn't give me many fragments, identification's tough, but boy, I get good sensitivity. I get that molecular weight, so I've gained molecular weight and sensitivity. So they each have their place, and very commonly they're used together. You might analyze an unknown by electron impact, and then analyze it by chemical ionization ionization. So now here's ephedrine by chemical ionization. What do we have out here? We've got our molecular weight. We have another fragment when we've just lost a, a piece of it. And here's our 58 again. But now we see our molecular weight. And if you can see that, <laughs> probably can't from where you are, um, it's 166. It's not a molecular weight of 165. It's 166. When I transfer energy from my reagent gas, that isobutane, ammonia, for example, I transfer energy, I transfer it in the form of a hydrogen ion. So I'm adding a hydrogen ion onto my ephedrine, and that's where the energy comes from. So for my parent ion, I don't get 165, I get 166. So it's always one mass bigger. And you obviously take that into account. You're looking for molecular weight. By chemical ionization, it would say 166. But you know it's 165 because of your, of your method. You know, some of the other uh, methods of, yep. You, m you might as well wait till I get back there. <laughs> Would all the peaks have a, a plus one, or what was yeah, it? A plus, well, an extra hydrogen trace. Nope. No, the other, the fragments won't. They, they will all have their masses because you transfer one hydrogen ion over, it transfers all of its energy, 
and some percentage will just hang on to the hydrogen ion knot fragment. Other ones break into pieces by themselves. So, no. So there's, a, like I say, a real large number of ways that you can go ahead and ionize this material. Um, I've, the two relatively new sources are DESI and DART, and I'll show you what, what they are in a moment. This is actually one that we're starting to use in, in our research. It's called MALDI, Matrix-Assisted matrix Laser Something uh, Ionization. I'll have to figure, look and see what that D stands for. Um, what is it? Oh, okay. I guess I should read my slide. <laughs> that's too easy. Okay. So that's a, a, a technique that's very nice. Uh, it's for, for high molecular weight analytes. Now, your, your advisor of your, I'm sorry, lecture, your teacher, would find this very useful in protein work. So this would be a common technique that she might use. High molecular analytes, analysis of proteins, peptides, glycoproteins, oligosaccharides, oligonucleotides. When we're dealing with the electron impact, we tend to deal with smaller molecules usually. Now we're dealing with large molecules. And so in what my application, which you don't have, is I'm interested in how flavor reacts with protein. Protein, a big topic today. Everybody wants protein, more protein in their diet, more protein in every one of their foods for some strange reason. But when you put flavors in there, those proteins are extremely reactive. You think back to biochem. What do you have for you know, groups, side chains coming off your proteins? You've got aldehydes, you have carboxylic acids, you have amines, you have alcohols, you've got thiols, you've got disulfides. Those proteins are extremely, extremely reactive. So I put a nice flavor into my protein beverage, my protein bar. It's nice day one, and then it starts to be, get worse and worse and worse. Why? They're reacting with the protein. And so our application is taking proteins and getting a mass spectrum of them. We get a molecular weight, then I put flavor in. If it chemically reacts, the molecular weight of my protein just went up. It increased by the size of my flavor molecule. So I can measure what reacts with my protein and how much it reacts. And we've never had that ability before, which is really fascinating. So what do we do? Um, <laughs> I like this one. This, this is uh, what one of the mass spectrometer operators, uh, when he used to lecture in the course, he's talked about how do you make a, a, an elephant fly? Does anybody know how to make an elephant fly? He, and he can't use pic, Pixar. What's it? <laughs> yes. Dumbo, is <laughs> my children would probably say, Dumbo the flying elephant. Um, that, that, that's a little tough. These are large molecules. They're not volatile. They're not going to go into the gas phase. You know, if you break them into, into pieces, maybe enough they might. But what, what you do is you, you put the elephant on top of a tall building, you blow the building out, and guess what? The elephant, elephant's flying. Maybe not very long, <laughs> but you've just made it airborne. And if you're in the process, yeah, I know it'd make a mess. Um, but if you, if you actually put electrical charge on what you do, that protein takes on a positively charged, you have a really strong negative current, you'll make it airborne, and then you'll put a charge in it, it'll suck it into the mass spectrometer. So there's ways to measure masses and fragmentation of really large molecules. And that's basically what the discussion is, is here. You put them into a matrix, so this is the idea. Here's our analyte. It's in a matrix. Hit it with high energy. It fragments. It blows this matrix apart. We've got some of them free that get drug out into our analytical system. So here's our ions that we just hit with a laser, blew it up. Ions get drawn into the, actually the analyzer part and then the detector. Really neat, uh, neat technology, neat methodology. These are what we call soft ionization. Electron impact is hard ionization. We put a lot of energy, blow it up. 
chemical ionization is a soft ionization. So we're not blowing it up as much. In just like chemical ionization, we have little fragmentation. So it's just too low energy. And so what that does is our protein may take on only one hydrogen. It may take only one hydrogen. And what that means is we can put our electrical current, our negative charge, to draw that protein out. We have limits on how big of a protein we can truly draw out. If we could put 10 charges on there, we could draw something bigger out and get it into the mass spectrometer. But if it's only got one, okay, there is a limit to mass that we can do. Otherwise, really large molecules, we can't analyze them by this technique. We have to use the technique that puts lots of charges on our fragments, on our piece. This is an analysis of, of a protein. And this shows its mass of being 2,466.7. That's a typical MALDI spectrum. We're looking for molecular weight at this point primarily. We're not getting much fragmentation to it. A little bit down here, 200, 300 masses, but this is our interest. What's its molecular weight? Of course, when I end up reacting my protein with a nice cherry flavor, which has aldehydes in it, I hope to see this moved up just the size of my protein, of my, of my flavor molecule. Al alternative fast atom bombardment. And so this is a very, very similar process, but you use a different way of putting a charge on. You don't use the laser to just inert, kind of blow up the matrix. You actually use something like argon or xeon, much, uh, much higher energy with this technique than the previous technique. And so we do get uh, more charges, more positive charges on the proteins. And so we can go a little higher in mass by this technique. And that's pr the primary difference. MALDI does maybe up to 200,000. And this will go over 200,000 molecular weight. And this is the process. Here's our atom, what we call an atom beam, or argon or xeon. It's in energy collisions, put charges on molecules, drag our molecule out into our anal analysis where we measure the fragments. This is a, these are techniques that I like. I like simple things. I have a simple mind. The more difficult it is, the more you shy away. There's got to be an easy way to do things. So I, I like this. I like it because there's no sample preparation. Basically, you put your sample in front of, uh, basically, uh, bombarding your sample with high energy particles, and you will knock some fragments, some charges off your sample. So simply bombards it with high energy, knocks off fragments, fragments get sucked into your mass spectrometer for analysis. This is uh, basically it, looking at uh, for pesticides on the surface of an apple. What do you have to do? What's your sample preparation? For gas chromatography, we soaked it in a solvent, right, for three minutes. That's what we did yesterday. And then we did gas chromatography. Here, I take the apple and I put it under the mass spectrometer, and I've got my data. Well, I love that kind of thing. This is a version of this. This is uh, more of a wet stream. So this will be a spray of liquid. This is a dry system. So we do exactly the same thing by, it's called DART. DESI was the other. DART is this one. And so where do we use this? Where do you uh, run across this? Every time you go to the airport. Uh, what do they do at that swab that they swab down your luggage or your hands or whatever they do? They take that swab and they put it right there in front of your ion source. It's bombarded with ions, sucks these ions in the mass spectrometer, it looks for explosives. So it's keyed to look for the mass and mass fragmentation pattern of explosives. This is a, another example, well, okay, but there's again many examples, it's just dry. Money, <laughs> where do $100 bills get checked for you know, drug trade or whatever else? by exactly the same type of technique. So very, very simple methodology. 
and a very rapid sensitive outcome to these things. So that's uh, the ways of ionizing a sample. So basically fragmenting it perhaps and then getting ions. Our next problem is, okay, we've got this whole mass of ions we just created. I want to separate them. I want to count them by mass. How many, so maybe there's a mass 12, how many fragments? Mass 13, how many fragments? 14, 15, 16, up to 200,000. So that's what our mass analyzer does. It separates all of those pieces into individual molecular weight pieces and counts them for you. So how do we do that? Four techniques. The latter three are much more commonly used today. Our first mass spectrometers were based on a magnetic sector instrument. They've largely gone away and been replaced by more versatile, cheaper, simpler techniques. This is a magnetic sector. What you do is you've got your ions, this whole jumble of fragments, ions that you just created when our molecule blew up. They are drawn into the magnetic field by an electric charge, a negative charge, so they get a velocity going up. And in some place from physics, there's a right-hand thumb rule about magnetic fielded force. And so the way this works is that if there's no magnetic field, they just crash into the magnet. That's not very interesting. If we put a little bit of magnetic field, those really small ions can actually be bent. So we'll have the magnetic field pushing on this, and small ions then will be focused. They'll make it all around the, the magnet. As we increase a little more that magnetic field, we'll be able to turn larger masses, increase a little more with larger masses. So what we do is we change the magnetic strength. We start off very low field, and we systematically increase it, and we constantly are, in, are getting a scan of the ions present in that fragmentation piece. So magnetic sector, it's a way of getting certain masses over here to be detected, kind of one at a time. This also is one of the earliest types of mass spectrometry, and uh, it really went away, and now has come back with a, a really high usage level. What this happens here is we've got our source over on this side. So here's where we're forming all of our fragments. It's an impulse. They get hit, they form the ions, and then the ions get drawn out here by electrical charge. And there's a timer, and it times how long for an ion to come from here to here. So what it's doing you know, you probably remember someplace in their kinetic energy, kinetic energy because one half mv squared. So all of your ions will have equivalent kinetic energy, but that speed depends upon its mass. Small masses have very high velocities. They go whizzing through, and by time you know what that mass must have been to get from here to here. And then you keep on. Larger masses, larger masses, go slower, slower, and slower. So what you're doing is you're timing from entering here to being detected here. Why this has become a popularity today, ability to measure time accurately. You're talking about nanoseconds, okay? At one time, we didn't have that ability. These things have tended to be very long because we had to longer times to measure. Now, with the ability to measure nanoseconds, we can start using a technique like this and do very well at it. We can time it so well, so accurately today, we can give you an accurate mass. We can say it's a mass 136.0117, which is absolutely amazing. It gives us molecular formulas, not just a mass of 136, but it tells us molecular formula. So it is the technique today in terms of mass spectrometry. Quadrupole kind of went in the middle of the time frame. It still is around. We've got four of them in our lab and a couple more on our uh, LCs. This is just a, another one where we've got our ions formed here. 
they're drawn out by electrical charge given a velocity down through the tubes. And these tubes are set up to vary the electrical field so that at a certain electrical field, we'll get those ions that survive the pathway. Everything else is going to crash into the walls, go out the pump, whatever the case may be. And then we change the field a little bit more, we can get the next mass up to make it down here to be measured. We change a little more, we keep on focusing different molecular weights down the pathway to the detector. So again, it's been a workhorse, it continues to, to be around. This is a, the last one and probably where we'll, uh, well, maybe we'll get a little further. But this is an ion trap mass spectrometer. The other mass spectrometer uh, analyzers that I've mentioned, the time of flight, the magnetic sector, the quadrupole, they're all more or less, I, I'm going to take a millisecond and I'm going to go count all the fragments in, in a millisecond. Okay. Then I take the next millisecond, I go ahead and count everything there. So I count only what happens to be coming through the mass spectrometer at that moment. The ion trap actually then traps ions. So instead of looking at what's there in a millisecond, it may trap those ions for, you know, oh, heck, 100 milliseconds, 1,000 milliseconds. And so what it does, it stores the ions. It traps it, collects, 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 and then dumps them. So what that means is you have much greater sensitivity. It's kind of like you're pooling your sample, pooling your sample, pooling your sample, now let's measure it. The other techniques don't permit that. You can just measure what's flowing through. Here I'm collecting it and then dumping it and measuring it. It's a, a nice technique. It really offers a great deal of sensitivity because of that idea of pooling and collecting. So not great for identification, but great for quantitation, the best technique. The ion detector, we can, we can do this one and go ahead and call it quits for now, but high energy collisions. This is, you know, this 10 to minus 12, 10 to minus 15 grams detection limit. That is really tremendous. Why is it so good? It's so good because we're measuring ions. Ions have some real advantages. When we look at our ion detector, it's set up with a cascade. And so this electrical charge, this ion, hits a first charged plate. And it gives off 100 new ions. Those 100 new ions are focused down to hit another one. It gives off 1,000 ions. That 1,000 ions go on and hit the next one. It's like a cascade down with a hundredfold magnification every time it goes back and forth. We can't do that with regular molecules, but ions are electricity. And we can go ahead and magnify that really nicely. So this is what makes mass spectrometry so sensitive. If it wasn't measuring ions, we wouldn't have really much sensitivity at all. So it is a, a wonderful detector from that standpoint. Um, Data interpretation. Well, let's take that out. There, we won't get any far, very far in a minute. How's that? So we'll call it quits. Any, any wisdom from the instructor? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, have a good afternoon. <laughs>